In this section, we'll explore the Rodriguez finite rotation formula. It's an elegant method which represents 3D rotations using just an axis and an angle, making it more intuitive than Euler angles. Also, it avoids the risk of running into gimbal lock and tends to be more computationally efficient than using direction cosine matrices, which can be bulky and less direct. And whether you're working in structural mechanics, robotics, aerospace, or computer graphics, Rodriguez's formula offers a clean, more reliable way to handle rotations. The derivation requires a combination of geometry and some basic vector algebra. So I'm going to take my time in trying to draw this best as I can in 3D and to explain it clearly and simply to you. This method was first derived by Olinda Rodriguez, the French mathematician, back in 1840. The idea is that if we take a vector that we're going to call R, we would like to rotate that vector R about another vector by some prescribed angle. So the rotation vector can be described by a unit vector, which we'll call n. The hat on top of the n indicates that it's a unit vector. And in rotating the vector r about n, that rotation will define a circular plane as such. So the vector n is normal to the plane of the circle. Let's assume that the rotated vector ends up in this position, where the tip of the rotated vector will clearly lie on the circumference of that circle. Now from the center of the circle of rotation, I'm going to draw two vectors, one to the tip of R and the other to the tip of the rotated vector. We'll assume that the vector is rotated through an angle phi, and we'll call this new rotated vector R prime. So R is the original vector, and R prime is the position of the rotated vector. Hopefully so far so good. Now starting at the tail here of these three vectors, R, R prime, and N, we can locate the tip of vector r prime using the sum of three vectors. These vectors are shown in blue. So summing the three blue vectors gives us the location of r prime. Note that this first vector is normal to the plane of rotation, whereas the other two vectors lie within the plane of the circle. And just to be a little bit more precise, let's label these points. We'll call this bottom point O. The tip of the initial vector r we will indicate with the letter m. The tip of the rotated vector will indicate with the letter N. L is the center of the circle of rotation. It's where the axis of rotation intersects the plane of the circle. And then we'll label this remaining point P. This will allow us to describe these individual vectors more clearly. The point where the tip of vector R lies can be described with the sum of two vectors. This vector here, OL, plus the vector LM. The vector Lm I will denote as R perpendicular, where this little subscript indicates perpendicular, because it's perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So R perpendicular is equal to the vector Lm. And then the other vector, that's vector Ol, I will denote as R parallel, where this little subscript indicates parallel. So R parallel is equal to Ol. And the sum of R parallel plus R perpendicular, or Ol plus Lm, is equal to r. This vector r can be written as the vector sum of ol plus lm. Now the angle between the vectors r and n, or n hat, we will denote alpha. So alpha is the angle between the two vectors, not to be confused with phi, which is the angle of rotation of r about n. Now to try to make this picture a little bit clearer, I'm going to draw it in two dimensions, looking from the top down in this direction. When I do that, I see a circle. Here is the center of the circle, and the first vector is R parallel, which is the vector Lm, and points to the tip of vector R, and then a second vector that points to the tip of R prime. So adding the letters, this will be L, M, and N, and then the angle in between them is equal to phi. Let's add a little bit more detail to this drawing. First of all, I'll add the blue vector, that's LP, and then the second blue vector that's in the circle PN. I'll remind you that the vector LM, the full length of this vector, we called R perpendicular. And let's draw the unit vector in the direction of LM. We'll use green for our unit vectors to be consistent. And that we'll just describe as the unit vector R perpendicular, which would just be this vector R perpendicular divided by its magnitude. 
In addition, we want a third unit vector in the direction of Pn. That's that vector. Now, how do we find this vector in the direction of Pn? Let me remind you that this vector is orthogonal to both the vector n and the vector r perpendicular, this unit vector. And as such, this vector Pn is orthogonal to both n and my vector r. So how do we find a vector that's orthogonal to both vector n and r? We take the cross product of the two. n cross r will give me the vector that's perpendicular to both of them. You might need to take a minute just to convince yourself of that, but yes, n cross r is a vector that's perpendicular to both n and r, and that represents the direction of Pn. And since it's a unit vector we want, we need to divide it by the magnitude of n cross r. So that will give us this unit vector. Okay, I hope I haven't confused anyone yet, because now that I have the picture fully drawn, we can begin with the derivation. The derivation itself is reasonably simple if you understand exactly what I've drawn up till now. All right, so we proceed as follows. As we showed on this drawing, the rotated vector r prime can be found by adding up these three blue vectors. So let's write that mathematically. The vector r prime is equal to the vector ol plus the vector lp plus the vector pn. And we're up to, I believe, number 29. Now let's look for a second at OL, this vector here. That vector is simply the vector R dotted with the vector N hat. So if I want to find OL, which is really just the projection of R along N hat, that would just be R dot N hat times the unit vector N hat. So the magnitude is R dot N hat, and it's in the direction of N hat, number 30. And let's put a yellow box around it because we're going to use that in a second. Now, our initial vector r can be found as the sum of r parallel plus r perpendicular. Let's write that out. r is equal to r parallel plus r perpendicular. And number 31. Rewriting equation 31 in terms of r perpendicular gives us that r perpendicular is equal to r minus r parallel. But what is R parallel? This is R parallel, it's OL. So let's just substitute 30 in there and we get R dot N hat times N hat. Now, since we want to find this vector, R perpendicular hat, and I've got R perpendicular, I can very easily find the unit vector R perpendicular by taking R perpendicular and just dividing it by its magnitude. So the unit vector R perpendicular is just this vector divided by its magnitude. And that's equation 32. All right, I want to try and squeeze this on the same page. It's going to probably get a little bit tight, but just bear with me, because I think it's far more informative to have all this information on one page where you can look at it at the same time. So let's make a little note here. Let's look at our drawing, and I want to indicate to you things that are equal in this drawing. If we take the magnitude of R perpendicular, that is the magnitude of this vector here, the length of that vector Lm. The magnitude of R perpendicular is equal to the magnitude of Lm. No argument there, I hope. But this is also equal to the magnitude of Ln. Why? Because Lm and Ln are both radii of the same circle. So we can say this is equal to the magnitude of Ln. But if we look at our original drawing, this drawing here, remember these two vectors here are orthogonal because the vector n hat is perpendicular to the circle of rotation, obviously, because we're rotating about that vector. So this is a right angle triangle, where the vector r is the hypotenuse of that right angle triangle, and we're going to assume that this angle is alpha between r and the axis of rotation. Don't confuse alpha with phi. Phi is the amount that we're rotating about the axis of rotation whereas alpha is the angle between the two vectors. Okay, so from basic trigonometry, you should be able to see that Lm, or the magnitude rather of Lm, is equal to the magnitude of r times sine of alpha. The magnitude of this line times sine of this angle will give us the magnitude of this line here, Lm. Okay, now a little bit of manipulation. We know that the magnitude of n, n is a unit vector, so its magnitude is one. So I can multiply this by the magnitude of n, 
and I haven't changed anything, I've just multiplied by 1. What is the magnitude of n times the magnitude of r times sine of the angle between them? Anyone? From basic vectors? This is the cross product of those two vectors. Okay? The cross product of two vectors is defined as the magnitude of the one times the magnitude of the other times sine of the angle in between them. That's how you calculate a cross product, or one of the ways you calculate a cross product of two vectors. And of course, this is a vector, so we're actually just talking about the magnitude of it. We'll number all of these equation 33. And with equations 33 in mind, we can now easily complete our derivation. So we need to find vectors LP still and PN. LP is equal to, these two vectors are orthogonal, so the magnitude of LP is just the magnitude of LN, which is the hypotenuse of this triangle, times cosine of the angle in between. So LP is equal to the magnitude of LN times cosine phi. And what is the direction of LP? It's the unit vector r perpendicular hat. And we have this expression for r perpendicular hat. So substituting that in, we get r minus r dot n hat times n. The denominator here, the magnitude of r perpendicular, cancels the magnitude of ln. Why would we explain that before, that r perpendicular and ln are both radii of the circle? And so that will be multiplied by cosine phi. And similarly, we can find the vector Pn by taking ln, the magnitude of ln, times sine of phi. And what is the direction of Pn? That's just this unit vector, which is n hat cross r divided by the magnitude of n hat cross r. And again, this ln and this n hat cross r will cancel one another out. Why? Because we explained it here. These two are equal. ln and n hat cross r are equal. So this gives us n hat cross r times sine of phi. Number 34 and 35, and let's put yellow boxes around each of these. All right, so we're basically done. Let's just put it all together on the next page, and I'm going to copy equations 29, 30, 34, and 35 to the next page. Just to make it a little bit clearer, we know that r prime is the sum of these three vectors, and we have expressions for each of these individual vectors, ol, lp, and pn. So all that remains to be done is to take equations 30, 34, and 35 and substitute them into equation 29. This gives us that r prime is equal to r dot n hat times n hat plus r minus r dot n hat times n hat all times cosine phi plus n hat cross r times sine of phi. I can rewrite this in a slightly different form by grouping everything that multiplies n hat. And this can be rewritten, therefore, as r prime is equal to 1 minus cosine of phi times r dotted with n hat, all in the direction of n hat, plus what's left from here, which is r cosine phi. And then, of course, the last term, n hat cross r sine of phi. And this, my friends, is the Rodriguez rotation formula. Number 36, and let's put a red box around it because we're done. So this is the Rodriguez formula, and it provides a very intuitive way of understanding what is going on in terms of the rotation. Unlike the Euler angle sequence, which makes it a little bit tricky to know exactly how the object is being rotated, this provides a very simple representation in terms of just a vector and a rotation angle. So it's easy to imagine the direction and the amount of rotation. It also tends to be less cumbersome than having to multiply together three separate matrices, like in the Euler angle sequence. And similarly, the direction cosine matrix, while it provides us a direct transformation, the DCM makes it very hard to imagine what the actual transformation looks like. What are the disadvantages of using this Rodriguez formula? In the event that you're stringing together multiple rotations, it tends to require a little bit more effort than either of the other two methods. And that brings us to the end of part three of this four-part mini-series. I hope you found something useful in it. If you did and you would like to support further content like this, please do me a favor and hit those like buttons. It really helps with getting these videos in front of other people like you. Or better still, subscribe to this channel by clicking on the link below and then clicking on the bell icon. This way you'll be notified of future video releases. I'm going to save the review of this part until I'm done with the fourth video, after which time I'll give a comprehensive review of parts one through four all at once. 
If you'd like the lecture notes for this video, they are available using the link in the video description below. If you have any questions, comments, or criticisms, I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. Thank you very much for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.